Good evening once again. We are just moments away from the only televised debate between the candidates for governor of the state of Michigan. Republican Rick Snyder is a businessman from Ann Arbor. He's squaring off against Democrat and Lansing Mayor Verge Bernaro. They are both hoping to win the state's top elected job on November 2nd. According to the latest Channel 7 Detroit Free Press poll, Bernaro has an uphill climb. It shows Bernaro trailing Snyder by 20 points. Epic MRA polled voters from October 3rd through the 7th and it has a margin of error of about 4 percent. The debate will be broadcast live from the Detroit Public Television Studios. The moderators are Stephen Henderson, editorial page editor of the Free Press, and Detroit News editorial page editor Nolan Finley. We'll have complete debate coverage on Action News at 11. Let's go now and hear... The Great Debates is made possible by the following coalition of business, labor, education, and nonprofit groups. From the Smith Studio at Detroit Public Television, this is the 2010 gubernatorial debate. Welcome to the Great Debates from the Smith Studio at Detroit Public Television. I'm Nolan Finley of the Detroit News. And I'm Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. We're your moderators today for the only televised debate featuring the two major party candidates for governor. Joining us for today are Republican nominee Rick Snyder, and Democratic nominee, Verge Bernero. Tonight's discussion will cover a wide range of topics, including economic growth, talent and education, and effective government. Each candidate will have one minute to answer direct questions, one minute for rebuttals, and 30 seconds for moderator follow-ups. We flipped a coin to determine the order of the two-minute opening statements, and Republican Rick Snyder will go first. Mr. Snyder. Well, first of all, I'd like to th thank the Great Debate Coalition for doing this. Why are we here tonight? Because we all love Michigan. But our state is suffering. We're an economic disaster. We have a broken government. It's not the time to talk about the problems or dwell on blame. The key is what's the solution? It's time to reinvent Michigan. And to do that, I'm bringing a clear, positive vision, a concise plan, and an attitude of action. The vision, we need to start a new era in our state. It is time for the era of innovation getting back to our roots of entrepreneurship and innovation. I've got a 10-point plan that really focuses on jobs and then an attitude of action. I'm a proven job creator. I want to bring real-world, common-sense solutions to Lansing. And for more information on those, please go to our website, rickformichigan.com. The other thing going with it, though, is we need to repair a broken culture. We need to change our culture in this state. We need to move from being negative to being positive. We need to stop looking in the rearview mirror and look forward. We need to stop being divisive and get rid of this win-lose attitude. It's time to be inclusive and win together. That's the attitude we need. With this framework of vision, plan, and action, and this new culture, we will create more and better jobs. We will keep our young people in this state, and we will be a great state again. Mr. Bernaro, you now have two minutes for your statement. Good evening. Let's be honest. State government isn't working for regular people. The well-connected and the wealthy, they get taken care of, while regular folks are being left behind. People are hurting. Families across Michigan are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to make their mortgage payment, payment to hold on to their job, and to get their kids a good education. We don't need corporate buzzwords or mission statements at a time like this. We don't need handouts for Wall Street or bailouts for companies who ship our jobs overseas. We need bold leadership, and we need it now. I've got a plan to turn Michigan around, to shake up our broken government, and to get this economy back on track. The Michigan I grew up in is a Michigan of opportunity, not just for the folks at the top, but for everybody. That's the Michigan I'm fighting for. And I'm getting results in my city. The Lansing region has the second lowest unemployment in the state. We've laid out the red carpet instead of the red tape for business, and that's working. We've secured half a billion dollars in new investment in my city, 6,000 new jobs. But while I'm busy creating thousands of new jobs here, unfortunately my opponent has shipped thousands of jobs overseas to China in his role as chief executive outsourcer at Gateway. But it doesn't stop there. I have to share with you some disturbing news. We've also learned that another of Mr. Snyder's companies has created jobs in China as recently as a couple months ago. 
Mr. Schneider is the founder and board director of a company called Desera. That company just finished a new state-of-the-art job-creating facility. But unfortunately, that facility wasn't built in Michigan. It wasn't even built in America. That plant and those jobs landed in Shenzhen, China. Here's what Mr. Schneider's chief technology officer told the press. Quote, Desira is helping Chinese businesses compete and win in the global marketplace. Helping Chinese businesses to compete and win? Yet you want to be our governor? What about Michigan workers? What about the 630,000 Michiganders looking for work? Mr. Snyder, how could you? All right, well, that's a very good start to this debate. Mr. Snyder, I want to give you a chance uh, right away to, to respond to what uh, Mr. Mr. Bonero said. Did you, is, do you own a company that is creating jobs in China? The CERA does not have an operation in China. They're based in San Jose, California, and they're based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, they're off doing cutting-edge technology, and they're doing work all around the world to be successful at that. But their locations are San Jose and Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's where their R&D has been done, and that's the technology we've put into use. With respect to the Gateway one, those are also untrue. I mean, I've gone through this so many times. At Gateway, I'm proud of my record. I ha helped create 10,000 jobs. And we'll still have more time. Well, thank you. I, I helped create 10,000 jobs and very successfully did that. When the company got in trouble, they asked me to come back. I came back as interim CEO and I brought jobs back to the U.S. I brought tech support and manufacturing jobs back to the United States. And why did I do that? Because I understand the value of the American worker and how it's much better to have high quality and great American workers instead of low cost labor. Mr. Bonero? I'd like a rebuttal. Yes, absolutely. Uh, look, as far as Gateway, uh, either he lied to the SEC or he's lying here tonight. He signed off on 10K forms to the SEC, uh, clearly approving and certifying the outsourcing that took place. As far as Desira, it's on two websites that they are expanding in China. Their own company, Desira, that he's on the board of, put out a press release saying they're moving R&D uh, overseas to China. And the specific quote is, we're helping Chinese businesses compete and win in the global marketplace. Uh, now, I, 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 it's, it's, it's astounding to me that somebody would run for governor of Michigan when we are, have so many people unemployed, when we need to be promoting our technology and getting our businesses on the cutting edge to think that you're investing this kind of time and money in China. What about Michigan? What about workers here that need work? Uh, the evidence is clear. We need somebody who's going to stand up for Michigan, fight for Michigan jobs. That's what I've been doing. When I was fighting for the auto industry, you were busy sending jobs to China. It's incredible. Where were you to stand up for the auto industry? Okay, we're going to go right to the first question of the, of the debate now. Uh, the current governor and legislature are leaving a little gift for the next governor, a $1.6 billion structural deficit. I want to know what sacrifices you will ask of Michigan residents to help you fill that hole. Will government provide fewer services, or will Michiganders pay more taxes? Mr. Snyder, you're first. In terms of what we need to do, I've talked about this consistently. We need to th put in a new budget system. I call it value for money budgeting. That gets to outcomes and results instead of the broken model today, which is simply about spending billions of dollars on activities and such. And as part of that, we're going to have to look at some tough issues. And one of the toughest issues the next governor is going to have to address is public employee compensation. And we need to do that in the light of understanding we're talking about people and their families. So it needs to be done in a very thoughtful way where there's shared sacrifice with people. We also need to do a number of things in terms of service consolidation between all our jurisdictions. To set the framework for this, I've called that a real balance sheet be done for the state so we can address these questions and get the facts out to the average citizen. No one knows our facts today, and what I'd love to do is get an opportunity in plain language to get a balance sheet out to all of us so we can see how far beyond our means we've spent. Mr. Bonero, what sacrifices will you ask of Michigan residents? Well, it's easy to talk about balanced budgets. It's another thing to deliver it. Um, I've delivered every budget in the city of Lansing on time, balanced, with no tax increase. Uh, I've got a double A plus credit rating. My running mate, Brenda Lawrence, the mayor of Southfield, nine times balanced budgets on time, no tax increase, no layoffs, and a double A plus credit rating. That is not easy to maintain in tough times. Uh, we did it by setting priorities. Uh, we have Lansing stat in place in Lansing, city stat, uh, where we measure outcomes. We know where everything is going. We know where every dollar is being spent. 
that. And we're going to do the same thing in the state in the state of Michigan. We're going to set the right priorities. We also had to have sacrifice. There was sacrifice all the way around. The workers have given up. They've sacrificed. I led by example. I cut my pay. I cut my benefits. I gave up the city car. Uh, it's important that sacrifice be shared from the top. You know, when times got tough in Lansing, I led the way. I sacrificed. I'd ask Mr. Snyder, when times got tough at Gateway, I know 20,000 people lost their jobs, the workers. What did you give up? I know you became a multimillionaire at that time. You cashed in your stock options. But what did you give up? I know the workers, they had the option to stand in the unemployment line. Okay, but what did you sacrifice? That's time, Mr. Manero. I've got a quick follow-up to that question. Do you think you can make ma expenses match revenues in Lansing? In other words, to eliminate the structural deficit in the first year that you're in office. Mr. Snyder? That's absolutely the goal. To say it's a certainty, until you get a chance to dig in, it'd be difficult to say that. Because my view is, is it's only when you get there where we get to the full extent of all the issues. If you looked at the last budget, there's a lot of concerns about the budget that are there. Are those numbers really even going to happen? So not only is next year a problem, I'm still concerned about we're going to have a hole for the current year when we reevaluate revenues and expenses. Mr. Bonero. We can and we will. We can and we will balance the budget uh, without gimmicks. And we're not, we're not going to rob Peter to pay Paul. If money is set aside for one thing, like the school aid fund, that's what it'll be spent on. Again, uh, I've got experience doing this. I've done it when I was in the legislature. I balanced the budget on time uh, with the legislature. Uh, we actually met our obligations. And as mayor, five times in a row, balanced budgets, no tax increase. Every year I had people saying we should increase taxes. We tightened our belts. We're delivering more bang for the buck. And what we've done in the city of Lansing, we can do in the state of Michigan. Gentlemen, this issue of outsourcing jobs to China has now dominated two elections in Michigan. Mr. Bernero, I want to ask you first, can Michigan and its businesses play in a global marketplace without engaging China? Well, engaging China is one thing, and shipping jobs and R&D. The important thing about this DeSera position is they're shipping R&D. They're actually helping vital R&D, uh, moving that and, and helping China to be on the cutting edge, not just shipping jobs there. Uh, look, it's a global economy. We have to operate in a global economy. In Lansing, we, we are competing and winning. We've grown manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, every month this year. We recently, in fact, it'll be voted on Monday night at Council, uh, secured 160 new jobs for a medical manufacturing company, Symmetry Medical. We were competing with Indiana and Malaysia. Indiana and Malaysia, but we won those jobs in Lansing, Michigan. So I know we can compete and win. Now, regardless of the fact that Rick Snyder, my opponent, told the Grand Rapids Press that manufacturing should be put to bed, I don't agree with that. I think manufacturing was a great part of our past and also a vibrant part of our future. The green automotive future, uh, the green technology, wind turbines, you name it. We can be in the business of manufacturing. We can win. We have to use the incentives. We have to use every tool in the toolbox. We're doing it in Lansing, Michigan. We're proving it every day. Mr. Snyder, same question to you. Can Michigan and its businesses play in the global marketplace without engaging China? Well, we absolutely need to play every place. That's how you succeed in a global economy. And we've got the core to do that. And to go to my opponent's comment there about manufacturing, manufacturing I've been a big advocate of. In fact, the Michigan manufacturers have endorsed me. And so that just shows, I mean, the distortions, again, that we have to suffer through in terms of the unfortunate issues. The other thing I would share with you is going back to the other points on Gateway and all these kind of charges. Actually, I will give you the quote from the Michigan Truth Squad on Mr. Bonero's TV ad called Tough. It's a tax on Snyder for being responsible for Gateway outsourcing or simply untrue. It's too bad that we can't talk about the real issue, which you're getting to, Nolan, is jobs, jobs, jobs. We need to stay focused on that, and we need to be looking at how we can export products out of Michigan all over the world in terms of opportunity for the future. Well, Mr. Uh, you a rebuttal, Mr. Yes, Bonero? please. Okay. The truth of the matter is that the economic development that Mr. Snyder engages in is primarily for himself and his friends in his pocketbook. Another company that he lists on his website is one that he promoted, Handy Lab, just recently was sold. And it was sold to you, I think, to the, for the price of about $275 million. I don't know how much of that you pocketed from personally, but 50 people are now unemployed in Ann Arbor because those jobs are going to another state. Meanwhile, I just won a medical technology company, Symmetry Medical, in Lansing. So I'm fighting and winning. I'm fighting for my people. I'm fighting for residents of the state. He's fighting for his own pocketbook. And at Gateway, you signed off on those documents. Look the folks in the face. Look look the, the Michigan residents in the face and tell them that you didn't sign those documents to the SEC, Rick, that you didn't sign off on them, and you were responsible for them. You want to play this shell game that you were CEO or COO or on the board. The point is you were in a position of responsibility. Why didn't you exercise that responsibility? Why didn't you fight the outsourcing? I was fighting General Motors, fighting for to keep our 
our jobs here, fighting for the auto industry. Why didn't you fight Time, against sir. the outsourcing? Mr. Snyder, would you like to respond? Well, again, there he goes again. I mean, he's being very consistent at least. I think if he says it enough times, it will become true. I mean, these allegations are just incorrect. That's why I talked about the Michigan Truth Squad and such as a third-party source of that. I mean, we need to be talking about the jobs of today. The real issue that matters here is we've lost a million jobs in Michigan. Let's put Michiganders to work. That's the environment, and I'm the proven job creator in this race. Well, I'd like to ask a follow-up along those lines then. Mr. Bernero, how do you create a job? Well, you set the table for it. Uh, that's what government does. That's what I've been doing in Lansing. I have $500 million in new investment in my city. I have cranes in the air. Uh, we have a great economic development team. We've uh, laid out the red carpet instead of the red tape. We've cut the bureaucracy. City bureaucracy is down 20%. We've put down the welcome mat for uh, businesses. That's how uh, government can be involved in creating jobs, and we've done it. We're getting results. The proof of the pudding is in the tasting. We have cranes in the air. Uh, we have people coming to Lansing. We've laid out the environment, and we need to do that in the state of Michigan. I think I'm the one Time, that's equipped sir. to do that. Mr. Snyder, how do you create a job? Well, you, you don't do it by being in government. Government doesn't create jobs. Government creates an environment where jobs can flourish. I know what it takes to create a job. I've done it many times, and I know what it takes during tough times to keep a company going. One of our companies came to a point where the lights were going to go off, and the other co-founder and I wrote personal checks, talking to our spouses, seeing what we could do to keep that company going. And it later went on to be a success. But it's by that determination. It, it is hard work to create a job. And let's get our government out of the way. We have the close for business sign up in Michigan right now. We need the open for business sign. Well, Mr. Snyder, Steve asked you all earlier about sacrifice. And taxpayers in Michigan, many taxpayers in Michigan, would like a lot of that sacrifice to come from the public sector workers who have seen their incomes grow 15% over the last decade, while per capita income in Michigan fell 21%. How much can public sector workers expect to give back under your administration? Well, there are two parts to that. The first piece, I say, is we need to look at what's comparable with the private sector. And then secondly, we need to ask what's financially affordable. Those are the two benchmarks. But we also always need to remember we're talking about people and their families. This is a serious issue. And so we need to come up with a solution to last for the long term. How we've done it in Lansing the last few years is a failure. It's a piecemeal approach. It's about talking about retirement one year, health care the next time. It's the death of a thousand cuts. My view is, is let's get compensation on the table to see how we do shared sacrifice, including the governor being part of that process, of us all sharing in what needs to be done to get government on a positive path where people don't need to be looking over their shoulders to be tapped on again, and they can focus on being more productive, more excited, and looking towards the future instead of looking over their shoulder all the time. Mr. Bernero, what sacrifice can public workers expect? Well, if you want to know what a person's going to do, the best thing is to look at what they've done. And when times got tough in Lansing, I led by example. I cut my pay. I doubled what I pay for health insurance. I gave up benefits. I didn't just ask the workers to sacrifice. And I'll do the same at the state of Michigan. I asked Mr. Snyder to say what sacrifices he made at Gateway when he became a millionaire while those jobs were outsourced. I didn't get an answer. I asked how many millions he made when Handy Lab was sold to him when he was president. Uh, he talks about jobs he's created. That must have been in the distant past because the only jobs we can find that he's creating now are in China. China, are overseas or in another state. We need somebody who's going to create jobs here in Michigan. That's my track record. That's what I've done, and that's what we need to be doing, is growing our economy for Michigan people, putting Michigan people to work. That's what I've done. I know we can compete because we're doing it, and we're competing using economic incentives. My opponent has said he's against the use of economic incentives. I say we have to use every tool in the toolbox. We can't afford to be hamstrung, to tie our hands behind our back when we're in a global economy. We are in a battle for our future. We've got to use every tool available. Mr. Snyder, you've indicated you wanted to rebut. Yeah, well, I want to give Verge credit. I mean, he's a, a great talker in terms of he gets several points in for every one I have a chance to respond to because of speed. That doesn't mean there's substance there. <laughs> so that's one of those things we need to look at. In terms of Gateway and my success there, the success I had was due to the building of the company. That, w that all happened before any jobs and the collapse of the company. The company went through extremely difficult economic times. What I got out of the company, actually, it's interesting. The mayor doesn't realize I used to set up two venture firms in our state. Most of those proceeds came back to build businesses in Michigan and create jobs in our state. And that's what we need to look to do in the future. It's about having success and taking that success to build the next success. If I may have a quick follow-up. Uh, Mr. Snyder, will you follow Detroit Mayor Dave Bing's lead and forego your salary as governor? Um, Nolan, that's a very good question. I haven't answered that when people ask me for... 
I intend to make some sacrifice, and I should. That's only part of it. But the reason I haven't answered that question is I didn't want it to be viewed as pandering, that I didn't want people voting for me just because I said I wouldn't take a salary. <coughs> so I will clearly take some major sacrifice because it's the right thing to do for our state. Mr. Bernero, will you, sac will you forego your salary? Well, uh, you're kind of hilarious, Nolan. I'm not a multimillionaire like my opponent. Uh, I'm sure that I will cut my pay. As I said, I'll sacrifice lo along with the other state workers, but I can't simply reach into my pockets from, uh, you know, y years of uh, corporate uh, gains and, uh, and uh, stock shares that I've cashed in on. So, no, I'll need a salary to support myself and my family. Okay, next question goes to Mr. Bonero first. For years, our chief strategy for creating jobs in Michigan has been to buy them with tax incentives, which is one of the things that we're seeing with the very popular film credits right now. Is that the right approach? And if not, what other things would you do as governor to encourage business growth? Well, I wish it was that we didn't need tax incentives. Uh, my opponent has taken kind of a philosophical approach saying that we, we should do away with tax incentives. Uh, I disagree. I think that would be unilateral disarmament. I may not like the global economy that we're in. There's a lot of things I'd like to change about it, but it's where we are, and we have to compete and win for those jobs today. We're doing it in Lansing. Uh, so I believe it's a question of math and not of politics. Uh, if the economic incentives are working, we're going to use them, and we have used them very effectively to pull down $500 million in new investment in my city, 6,000 new jobs. It is working. Uh, as far as the film tax credits, uh, I'd hate to pull the rug out from underneath them right now. I, I'm starting to see some, some real investments of infrastructure in our state, uh, but we need to see those investments, and we need to look at the whole picture. We need to look at the, the actual dollars brought in, then the economic impact, the ripple effect, the, the small businesses that are being uh, attracted, and so on. If it works financially, if it makes sense, we'll keep it. If it's not, we'll throw it out. We can't afford to be ideologically based uh, in terms of biased one way or another about these things. If they're working, we keep them. If not, we throw them out. Mr. Snyder, you've been a critic of the of the film tax credits. Uh, would you keep them? And uh, what other things would you do to try to create economic growth? Well, let's talk about the incentives for a minute. And it is a math problem. And the math problem is is you don't create jobs by buying people into our state and giving huge checks out to people. You create jobs by having free enterprise work. And you have free enterprise work by having the most level competitive playing field you start with. Why do we have these massive incentives? It's in large part because we have a broken tax and regulatory system. So instead of putting a Band-Aid on something, instead of addressing a symptom, let's fix the underlying issue. It is time to eliminate the Michigan business tax. It should be replaced with a flat 6% corporate income tax. Our regulatory environment's also messed up in the state. And as we get our act together, there should be much fewer needs for incentives in general. The incentives have largely been a political gimmick. The idea that we're going out to bring in a few large out-of-state companies here with massive incentives is not the answer. The comeback of Michigan are Michigan businesses being started right here in our state with Michiganders. Okay, as you both know, uh, and this question goes to Mr. Snyder first. I solicited free press readers for questions. Uh, the one I chose came from a young man named Daniel O'Connor, who's a graduate state, a student at Michigan State University, and he lives in Royal Oak. He asks, the growing section of our economy is services, and the growing section of our population is retirees. Yet, under the current tax system, both are largely shielded from taxes. As governor, would you support a revenue-neutral structural tax reform bill that shifts the burden towards services and retirees and away from other job providers who would entice more professionals and young families to Michigan. Mr. Snyder? That's not how you address tax reform. In terms of going after the starting point in our state, given the environment we have, is we have to get rid of the job killer, and that's the Michigan business tax. It is fundamentally unfair. It simply needs to be replaced, and I propose replacing it with a flat 6% corporate income tax. That would take the business burden off of most small businesses because they're not even corporations. That's the right attitude. We need to go from job killer to job creation. It would make us among the most competitive in the country. The next tax on the list after that that is creating havoc is the personal property tax. And that's the environment that I'm getting recognition from across the state when I go to town halls. People want to see the MBT go away. As I've said on the campaign trail, when they brought it in, they replaced the single business tax. It's just like Lansing went to the video store and rented Dumb and Dumber. Mr. Bonero. 
Uh, it's funny that uh, my opponent talks about Dumb and Dumber. He's got one of them working for him. Uh, one of the guys who authored the Michigan business tax that he wants to eliminate is actually Brian Kelly, his lieutenant governor. So I guess if you don't want Dumb and Dumber, you better not vote for the Republican ticket. Uh, look, we need real reform. There's no question about that, and we're going to get that. Uh, we need to make Michigan the number one place in the country to do business, uh, and we can do that. Uh, of course, the MBT surcharge is going to go. Brian Kelly helped create it, and I'm going to eliminate it. Uh, we're going to come up with a fair, equitable, and predictable tax system. Uh, and we're going to work with the business community to do that. But I'll never increase taxes on small business, which is what his 6% would be. For a lot of people, a lot of businesses who are paying 1.8%, 6% would nearly treble their tax bill. I'll never do that to small business. Uh, and, and yes, we, we, we need to reform the tax system, but not with a, a regressive system. I'm afraid the proposal that came in from the reader uh, would be regressive. And so I couldn't go that way. And I can't increase taxes at a time like this. It's the last thing we need to do is to increase taxes on small business or folks that can least afford it. You wanted, you wanted a rebuttal, Mr. Steiner? Oh, sure. I think it's appropriate. I mean, it's one thing to how you address things. It's another to be negative on people. And to make a comment about my lieutenant governor candidate, I mean, that's just not the right way. Brian Kelly actually fought hard to put in that provision you talked about, the small business credit, to really bring down the burden on small businesses. He was a leader in doing that. And to put it in perspective, um, your comment about increasing tax liability is inaccurate. Because, again, it's getting to the facts. It takes that burden out of proprietorships, S-corporations, and sole proprietorships. They wouldn't pay any tax under the system because they're paying a double tax today. So we don't need to get bogged down in taxes other than to say the MBT is really bad. And simply reducing the surcharge is not the answer. If you have a dumb tax and you reduce it by 20%, you still have a dumb tax. It fundamentally needs to be eliminated. Mr. Bernero, you've called for a moratorium on mortgage foreclosures in Michigan. Are you worried about the unintended consequences of such a, a measure, such as more people deciding not to mail in their monthly payment? I'm worried about the consequences of the fraud and the problems, the mistakes that are happening from Wall Street uh, that is pressing down on our people. Uh, we need to stop that immediately. I'm delighted, uh, pleased that Bank of America has said they're going to stop in Michigan uh, immediately. We need the other Wall Street banks to follow suit. We need a moratorium for all the people in Michigan so that they can review their practices and know what they're doing. I say, Nolan, we should err on the side of the homeowner. Let's err on the side of keeping people in their homes. Uh, most, The vast majority of people, nobody's trying to trick the bank. Nobody's trying to hold back. Uh, people are good people who are going to pay their bills. But, you know, I just find it interesting. My opponent is willing to side with the banks, to immediately assume that they're doing everything right. Uh, I, I can't assume that. I've seen too many mistakes. We've fought to keep thousands of people in their homes in Michigan, in Lansing, through a program called HoldOnToYourHome.org. I've seen how people have been treated by the big banks. They can't even get through. We need to err on the side of keeping people in their homes. It'll help not only them, but all the other folks who are struggling, all the other folks who are impacted by it. When one person, when a home goes down, the property values of all the others suffer. Thank you. Mr. Schneider, next question to you. Oh, you call your he gets to answer that one. I'm sorry. You, we missed you? Okay. <laughs> we don't want to rush you. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I appreciate that. In terms of the issue of, of a moratorium and such, first of all, people are suffering. This is extremely difficult economic times. But a blanket moratorium isn't right, and the mayor had called for a two-year moratorium across the board on mortgages, I believe. I believe President Obama came out today and talked about how that would not be a good idea. And in fact, if you looked at the moratorium idea, the last time that was done was back in the Depression, and that led to the bank holiday and the banks being closed when 34 states did the same thing. We have to have good programs to help people that are suffering. They're there, and we need to deal with those appropriately. The other thing is, is if any bank's doing anything wrong, there are rules to deal with that. And we need to strongly enforce those rules, because if someone's out of line, particularly when you're talking about someone's home, we need to stand up for those people and deal with the banks that are doing the bad things. You want to rebuttal? Mm -hmm. um, we have to remind gentlemen, under the rules you two negotiated, you each got three rebuttals, and this will exhaust those rebuttals for both candidates. Well, I just wanted to give a news flash to my opponent that, in fact, the banks are doing plenty of things wrong, and the rules aren't working. This might come as a shock to you. I know it doesn't so much affect the people at the top, but regular folks are being put upon. The banks are getting away with murder. I'm here to tell you, 
We see it every day. There's a, an example of it in your state, your newspaper, Stephen. There's just read the free press if you want the evidence of it, and I can give you a whole lot more from the folks at HoldOnToYourHome.org. I'm sure you can talk to your folks in Ann Arbor. There's plenty of abuse going on all around this state with people being kicked out of their homes. It needs to stop now. And so, yes, I say err on the side of keeping people in their homes. Don't err on the side of the banks. They've made plenty of mistakes. They've hurt plenty of people and thrown them out when they didn't deserve it. And you can see there's a clear difference here. My opponent says the, the rules are working fine. If you think the rules are working fine and the banks are treating people fairly, he's your guy. I don't believe that. I'm going to take action. I'm going to use my position as governor to protect regular folks who are being put upon by Wall Street. Thank you. Now for that next question. Mr. Snyder, you call yourself one tough nerd. The nerd part we get, but are you tough enough to play political hardball when the situation calls for it? Absolutely. I'm proud of my track record. As a successful business person, you need to learn how to deal with people, both in terms of dealing with customers, suppliers, all those kinds of situations. And I've been very successful at working through those. And in fact, one illustration I'll give you from the Gateway experience was so we had to negotiate patent licenses with people in order to be able to sell our products. And the companies I had to negotiate with were people that wanted to put us out of business. Compaq, Dell, IBM, very adverse situations. And I was able to work through those effectively and make situations where we could respect one another. We fundamentally disagreed, but we were able to come up with tough conclusions. Also, I've got a great track record in the community setting. I helped build Ann Arbor Spark. I wrote their business plan and was their founding chair. And that was a case so of not adversarial situations, but b by bringing a community together of the universities, the pi private sector, the public sector, and create a partnership that led to many jobs being created in our community. And Mr. Bernero, you've called yourself the angry mayor. Is anger an effective tool for building much needed bipartisanship in Lansing? Well, I was dubbed the angry mayor by uh, Fox News or CNN when I was fighting for the auto industry. Uh, and I don't mind that because uh, I think a lot of people are angry and a lot of people are hurting. It's not enough to be angry. It's how you use that anger and that passion. And I've used it to stand up for working people, and I'm proud of my record. Uh, and, you know, look, I've had to fight people that wanted to increase taxes in Lansing. I've gotten the job done. The proof of the pudding is in the tasting. And I've gotten the job done in the city of Lansing. It's tough to govern. It's tough to be mayor of a city. It's going to be even tougher to be governor. So you better be tough. And you better be able to channel anger and passion. My opponent says he's tough enough. Uh, he's certainly tough enough to profit and send jobs overseas and to send jobs to other states. Uh, he's tough enough to stand up and pocket money even when people here are losing their jobs. So uh, he may be a little tougher than me in certain regards. But uh, I've put my anger, my passion to good use, I think, and I'm ready to do the job as governor to lead this state forward. Next question to Mr. Venero first. The recent documentary, Waiting for Superman, takes a pretty hard swipe at teacher tenure. And of course, here in Michigan, we have some of the strongest tenure laws in the country. You have uh, the strong support of teacher unions in this state. If you're elected, can you stand up to them and ask them to take another look at tenure and maybe revisit whether it's time for reform? I haven't seen the movie yet, but uh, Stephen, you may know my wife is a 20-year-plus public educator, and my heart uh, goes out to all those educators out there, especially the first educators, the parents, uh, who are doing the job with our children. I appreciate what you do day in and day out. Education is near and dear to our heart. We think every child in Michigan deserves a quality, top-quality public education, uh, and I'll work hard every day with my wife at my side to make sure that happens. Uh, teacher tenure, uh, I'm happy to revisit that. I mean, who better to do it, uh, to talk to the unions about it, than somebody who's been working with them? You you know, if you look at my record as mayor, I've stood up. I haven't always been able to say yes to the unions. I appreciate their support, but they've had to make concessions. They've had to sacrifice, just like the UAW at GM. Uh, my UAW at the city has made sacrifices. Again, I made sacrifices. Do we have to change the way we, we do things? Absolutely. We're all going to have to change. We've got to compete and win in today's economy. The teachers I know want those kids to compete and win, uh, and we'll do what it takes to make sure that that happens. Mr. Snyder, is it time to revisit teacher tenure? Absolutely. That and many other things. We're, we have a failed education system. The kids are not the goal anymore. It's too much about spending money when you go to Lansing. All they talk about Lansing is this funding level or that funding level. The fundamental question behind it all is what do we need to do to get our kids an education each and every year that's very successful? And we need to look at tenure. We need to look at merit. There are many things we need to look at. But we do want our frontline teachers to be successful. It's not about being hard on them. It's about creating an environment for success and letting them win and feel empowered. Now, with respect to the dollars and how that works in terms of are you being influenced, I'm the candidate that stood up and said last year before I became an announced candidate that I wouldn't take a dollar of Packer special interest money. 
I'm proud to say I can look anyone in the eye and say, I have no baggage. I'm a self-made person. I have no special interest ties, and my only interest is to represent all the people of the state of Michigan. Our next question goes to Mr. Snyder first. Michigan's troubled urban centers need help, and typically the discussion about that in the state centers around revenue sharing, which we all know has been dwindling in recent years. Uh, I'd like both of you to talk about ways other than revenue sharing that Lansing might be able to aid places like Detroit or Lansing or Saginaw or Flint. Mr. Snyder. Sure. If you look at one of the roles as governor is not to run the cities, but to be their best partner. And I'll use Detroit as an illustration because I've said the only way Michigan can be a great state is if Detroit's on the path to being a great city. And the right way to do that is to partner. And Mayor Bing is an outstanding illustration in the city council there. We've got a great opportunity, but on their own, they're going to run into structural barriers. And the state should be there to help break through those barriers, to do what needs to be done. And that gets to things like value for money budgeting. Let's take a new approach on how we allocate our dollars where they actually show meaningful, measurable, tangible outcomes that positively impact real people instead of simply spending dollars. The other thing is, is we should be looking at our communities and how we engage the neighborhoods more. It's not about Lansing doing everything. One of the words I really don't like is, I'm here from Lansing, I'm here to help. That makes me nervous. So how do we engage our communities and really do public-private partnerships where we do things on the ground with the people there taking the charge and making the difference? Mr. Bonero, what about uh, help from Lansing? Well, as you know, uh, Brenda Lawrence and I are mayors on Main Street. We are two mayors for Main Street. If anybody knows what our cities are up against, it's us. We face it every day. We're on the front lines. We make, we make sure that the 911 calls get answered, that the potholes get filled, uh, and that the garbage gets picked up. We're also working with small business every day, negotiating with small business, medium business, and even big business. We're negotiating in Lansing with GM for a new global platform, a $200 million uh, expansion that'll be 640 jobs. So we're on the front lines doing it. Uh, our cities need to be the hub of the wheel and not the hole in the dome. Detroit is the face of Michigan. Anybody who believes that we're going to move Michigan forward and leave Detroit behind is kidding themselves. We need to look at economic development policy, education policy, transportation policy, yes, revenue sharing policy. We need to look at all those in terms of how it affects our cities. The fastest growing states have the fastest growing cities in them, and we ignore that at our own peril. There's the, the, that's not just coincidence. We need to pay attention to our cities. We need to do a better job and look at my economic development plan at voteverge.com. I've got specific strategies and an urban agenda to help bring back our cities. We must do this. Okay. Mr. Bernero, the census numbers released last week drew a direct link between a state's educational attainment and its prosperity. What would you do to fix the public schools, to support the universities, and make Michigan smarter? I appreciate the question, Nolan. You know, we've been talking about economic development as though it's just uh, bricks and mortar and jobs and companies. And, of course, those are very important. We need to be investing here in Michigan and not overseas or have our jobs go to another state. But we also have to recognize, as I think your question does, that education is economic development. That's where it begins. When I travel around the state, somebody asked me once, what's the next big thing for Michigan? You know, uh, if we had cars, and, 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 of course, I'm not giving up on cars, but what, what after cars? What's the next big thing. I thought about it for a minute and my answer was the next big thing is in the mind of a child sitting in a classroom in Detroit uh, or in Bloomfield or in Pontiac or in Grand Rapids or in Flint. The next big thing is in the mind of a child and we have to make sure that every child is nurtured, that every child gets that quality education, a full all-day class, uh, all-day kindergarten and a, and a good classroom education with music, art, and PE and support our great university system because that's where economic development begins. Mr. Schneider, how do you make Michigan smarter? Well, that's absolutely critical, and education is the forefront of that. And that's one reason I like to talk about the system, not as separate buckets, but as P20. Early childhood through lifelong learning. That's what really matters. And you start with the early childhood, and it's not the government doing it. It's public-private partnerships. We need to reinforce that and give the kids an opportunity at the youngest ages, particularly when they're in a disadvantaged situation. K through 12, again, that's a situation I talked about. Lansing talks about funding. It's all about spending money. Let's start talking about how we measure success, how we make sure the kids are getting a great education each and every year, and look at merit and opportunities for teachers to succeed. And then our higher ed system, we're truly blessed with one of the best systems in the world. But we need to engage them more in the process. First of all, they need to be more cost efficient. They need to be looking at things like value for money budgeting and bring down the cost because tuition is too high. But at the same time, they're one of our key economic development engines. That's one of the ways we're really going to succeed is engaging them more in our economy because it's about jobs, jobs, jobs. Quick follow-up, gentlemen. If you're going to make education 
a priority. I assume you're going to spend more money on it. What will you spend more, less money on? Welfare, corrections? Where will you get the money to make education a priority, Mr. Bernero? Well, I'll tell you, Nolan, I've balanced five straight budgets with no tax increase. Every year I had council people saying, we've got to increase taxes. We're going to need more money. We tightened our belts. We're doing more with less. I led by sacrificing myself. I cut $42 million in deficit. And look, we're going to have to tighten our belts in state government. I intend to conduct a forensic audit. I intend to find out where every dollar is spent. I intend to implement something called my stat, similar to Lansing stat that I've done in Lansing, to measure every dollar so we know where it's coming from. Uh, we're going to be more efficient, and we're not going to go to the people and say, you've got to pay more so that we can continue to do the same thing the same way. Mr. Schneider, same question to you. What would you cut to provide more funding for education? Well, no, and that's part of that whole process of value for money, but specifics in that would, again, be back to public employee compensation for people in the educational system. We need to look at that. But again, we have to recognize you're talking people and their families. The other thing is, is we need to look at service consolidation. We have 500 plus school districts and charter schools. Between all those school districts, there's got to be ways to have more opportunity, not for legal consolidation, but for service consolidation in terms of adding efficiencies. I believe the dollars are there. We need to be looking at those dollars about how we can deploy them better on the front lines. Mr. Um, Snyder, your opponent tonight has tried to paint you as a heartless CEO. Um, how can vo voters be sure if you're elected governor, you won't be carrying the chamber's water, but you'll be representing the interest of the taxpayers and all the people of Michigan? Well, no, and that's why I said I wouldn't take a dollar of Packer special interest money, because I don't want any ties. I mean, we need a governor representing all the people. And my whole campaign's about being inclusive and winning together. That's been the focus. And I grew up in a 900-square-foot home back in Battle Creek. I worked my way through college, so I understand those challenges. I mentioned earlier about keeping a company going by writing personal checks, again, to keep those jobs for people. That's the kind of attitude, and I've given a lot back to the community. We need to stay in touch. I helped create Ann Arbor Spark, an organization to create jobs. And it came through big time when Pfizer closed up and we lost 2,000 jobs. We were able to keep over 800 people and their families in our state with that attitude. And that's the approach I'm going to bring to Lansing, is it's about Michiganders working and winning together. Mr. Bernero, your campaign is heavily financed by labor unions. Will you be able to say no to those labor unions when it comes time to enact, enact reforms that they may object to? If you want to know what a person's going to do, look at what they've done. I've stood up to the unions when I had to in my city. I would not have a double A-plus credit rating if I, if I had given the unions everything they wanted, obviously. Uh, we led together. We worked together. The, my labor leaders sat with me at the table. We attacked the problems instead of attacking each other. And they have made concessions. They have made painful concessions. I gave things up. My cabinet members gave things up. That's the way it's got to be. I asked before, what did Mr. Snyder give up when those workers were eliminated at Gateway, when the workers were eliminated at Handy Lab? What did he give up? The, the, the price tag was $275 million for that company. He got, while the, got out while the getting was good as CEO. Uh, look, I've been standing up for Main Street. I've been working for standing up for regular people. Uh, his experience is something else. He's involved in economic development, yes, but it's for himself and the folks at the top. I'm worried about everybody. I'm worried about the community. I think when you create a middle class, that's when you create the future. That pays off. There's a magic about taking care of the people in the middle, not just the people at the top. Next question goes to Mr. Bernero first. We've all become very fond of saying this is the era of bipartisanship. So in that spirit, I'd like each of you to tell me what about the, your opponent's campaign you really like and tell me what would worry you about him being governor if he's elected. Mr. Bern Bernero. Uh, well, Stephen, of course, there's very little about his campaign I like. As far as him, uh, I like the fact that he's a family man, that his family is included. Uh, he talks about his wife helping him make the decision to run for governor. That's similar to my situation. I appreciate that. I respect that. Uh, you know, I kind of like the bus. Uh, he calls it the Nerdmobile. Uh, I kind of like it. I can't afford one. Uh, but uh, I, I like the, the town hall meeting if he would uh, invite regular folks, you know, and have it be a debate. I offered, you know, this is our only debate we're getting. I wanted more debates. Uh, I 
said, let's have, and I appreciate how you treated me when I came to the one, but you know, they were folks that were for Rick and they were very polite to me. But I said, let's have some real town hall meetings. Let's invite people uh, who aren't, haven't made up their mind. Let's get a big auditorium and have a real town hall because you call it a town hall, but let's have a real one. Uh, and, and you know, he wasn't agreeable to that. So this is the only debate, the only chance that people are going to have. I, I feel really bad about that. Uh, I wish that, uh, you know, he would have come back with the three. He originally, he agreed to three. I wanted eight. He took the three off the table. So we have just this one debate. It's, it's a real shame. I think people deserve more time to see us uh, answer questions unscripted. Mr. Snyder, are there ideas uh, that are part of Mr. Bernero's campaign that you can use? And if he's elected, what would worry you about it? Well, I'm running a positive campaign, so to be blunt, I'm going to pass on the second part of that. But in particular, I mean, I give the mayor credit. He loves Michigan. That's why we're both doing this. It's, we love our state, and we have a state that's suffering. The other one is, as he mentioned, my family, I really respect his family. I've had the opportunity to actually have a dinner where his daughter was sitting at the same table, and he's got a great family. And that's something to be admired and respected. So in terms of those things, we want to have good people in the political process. In terms of the issues, again, we don't have a lot in common in terms of how we approach things. I'm a positive person, and unfortunately, we've had too many negative things go on. Um, but I'm not going to spend time on that. I will go back to his comment, though, that he made comments about Handy Lab and some of our other com companies. In fact, when the company was sold, many, many of the employees shared in that, and they had an opportunity to win. They weren't excluded from that process. They had stock ownership, just like I had stock ownership in Gateway. It was the same method that I shared, they shared. And I believe in that and having them participate in that process and have the opportunity to win. And now they're going off to create new companies. Many of the people had already left, time and they're being time. serial entrepreneurs other places. Uh, next question to Mr. Snyder first. Uh, states that have healthy income growth all have one thing in common. Uh, they generously support their institutions of higher ed. Meanwhile, here in Michigan, we're one of only a handful of states that spends more on prisons than we do on, on higher ed. Uh, if you're elected governor, would you change that? And if so, how? Well, we do need to invest in higher ed. Higher ed is one of the great assets of our state. We have our natural resources. We have our higher ed system. We have several other things, but those are the gems we have, but they're being threatened in terms of our higher ed system. And a lot of that, we do need to get to this issue about being more efficient, though. We do need to ask them to look at new ways of doing things, again, focusing on being the very best on the front lines with instruction and research and helping our kids succeed, but it has become too costly. The other thing is, is I think we need to look at need-based assistance to our students. Again, the Michigan Promise, which helped everything, was very noble. But in terms of priorities, we need to help the kids in the biggest need. And we need to define need more broadly, because there are people in the middle that need an opportunity to get their kids to college. So let's create an environment of success and let them go ahead and have an opportunity to get a great education. I know what it's like. I paid for my own. I worked my way through school. And today, that would be very difficult, given the cost features that they face today. Mr. Bonero. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, certainly we need to reverse that trend, and we've got to do a better job with our correction system. Uh, if we had another hour, we could debate about the correction system, but no doubt we need to be doing a better job. A recidivism rate of 40 or 50 percent is far too much. We spend a lot of money for people in prison, and basically we're not dealing with their addictions and the issues, the mental health issues and others. We need to do a much better job on the front end, getting people mental health treatment, getting them treatment for their addictions uh, so that they don't end up in prison. We can save a lot of money, which we can redirect to education. And I want to give a shout out to all the students out there. I know there's a lot of students watching in debate parties, uh, debate gatherings. Thank you for your interest. You can make a difference. This is your state, too. We're looking out for you. We want to stop the brain drain. We want you to stay here. Uh, I intend to restore the Michigan promise. My opponent uh, is in the Detroit Free Press today saying he's opposed to that. I don't know if that's correct, Rick, uh, but that's what it says. Uh, look, we need to arm our prisoners with education. We know that's the common denominator that a lot of them have dropped out of school. So let's do a better job, and we'll be able to put more money into education. And we've also got to convince the universities to keep tuition costs down. Come on, share with us and tighten your ear belts so that we can stop this constantly increasing tuition. Quick follow-up to that, uh, Mr. Snyder. Uh, do you support uh, increasing funding for pre-K and other early education programs for children zero to five, especially those aimed at low-income families? And if so, how would you pay for it? Well, we talked about that a little bit before, because it is something that we would need to find the resources for. Before we start talking about the government doing it, though, I'd like to take leadership about how we do it in public-private partnerships. That's been my, my success. I go back to my days even in Sioux City when I was at Gateway. They had a fabulous program that was part of it, the United Way, called Success by Six. It was a public-private partnership that came out of Minneapolis. It did fabulous work on helping those kids in that age group succeed.
Before we look at the government, again, showing up with people from Lansing that are saying we're here to help, let's figure out how we can work together through our communities and have the government play a coordinating resource. Mr. Bonner. Uh, look, again, this is science and not politics. We know how vital those zero to five years are. Those are crucial years. It matters. It makes a difference. There's a reason for us to get in there and make sure that children have great uh, care, uh, that they have uh, preschool in that zero to five period. That, that whole zero to five continuum from the time they leave the hospital, we need to pay better attention to that. We know from the Ypsilanti, Ypsilanti Perry School uh, project that it works. We need to invest in it. Every dollar that we put into that has a payoff down the road. It will be a priority. We will make it a priority. Mr. Bernero, this campaign is about economic issues, but in Michigan, social issues are never far from the surface. Can you tell us precisely where you stand on the issues of abortion, gay marriage, affirmative action? Sure. Uh, uh, affirmative action, we, we're, we're stuck with a state uh, law that says, uh, the, the state constitution says there won't be any. Uh, we're working hard in my city to make sure that we continue to have a diverse police force, a police, a diverse workforce uh, by uh, doing recruiting so that our workforce reflects the diversity of the community. Uh, I am 100% pro-choice. I believe in a woman's right to choose. I don't believe that the government uh, should interfere between a woman and her doctor uh, in her faith if she wishes. Um, I think those are personal decisions that should be left to that. Uh, on the issue of gay marriage, uh, we have a state uh, constitutional provision in place. Uh, I do support civil unions. I, I, I personally don't have any problem with, with gay marriage. Uh, I don't have a problem with, with uh, personal monogamy. If somebody wants to spend their life with one person, I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I don't know why government would want to step in the way of that. Um, so I think we should look at uh, you know domestic partnerships and civil unions that can be done uh, without uh, broaching that constitutional uh, requirement or restriction that's there. Thank you, Mrs. Snyder. Same question to you. Abortion, gay marriage, affirmative action, they never seem to go away in Michigan. No, and, and they're important issues, and they mean a lot to people. Um, what I would say on abortion, I'm pro-life, and I have exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. On gay marriage, marriage is between a man and a woman. But people should also have the ability to make contracts between themselves. And then affirmative action, um, in terms of where that is, is I don't believe in quotas. We shouldn't have quotas. I did support the item of having preferences, but that was decided in our Constitution. Many of these issues were decided over the last few years, and I respect the answers, because the focus we need to get to in our state is not just social issues, but jobs. I hear from people on social issues, but it keeps on coming back to jobs, jobs, jobs. So let's get the Open for Business sign up in Michigan, because in <coughs> fact, what you can do as governor is by creating jobs, we address many of the social issues. If you're pro-life or pro-choice, one of the best answers we can get is to create jobs because that helps abortions go down overall. So let's focus on the big issue of jobs. Okay, we have time for one last question. We all know Michigan has the worst roads in the nation. Mr. Snyder, would you support an increase in the gasoline tax to fix them? I don't support an increase in gas tax because we need to get efficient first. I mean, we need to look at value for money budgeting. Because if you go around our state, our roads are terrible, but let's tighten our belts. Let's be efficient and see where we can deploy these dollars to fix the roads that really need to be fixed. A classic illustration I use from the Ann Arbor area, if you went to the Michigan-Michigan State game, you had to suffer over the Stadium Street Bridge, potentially. <laughs> Two lanes are permanently cl closed on that bridge. I think it's got a rating of like 2 out of 100. At the same time, I live near Gettys Road in US-23. They just built a bike and pedestrian bridge across US-23 at the cost of millions of dollars. What they didn't bother to tell us is a quarter mile south that there's a bridge over the Huron River and there's a bike and pedestrian path there. So let's get efficient about where we're deploying these dollars. There's a much better way to do things. And that's what we should focus on first. Mr. Bernero, would you support a gasoline tax increase to fix the roads? Uh, I can't support that at this time, Nolan. As a mayor, I'm on the front lines. Uh, I'm responsible for my roads, and we put a lot of money into roads. I, 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 I could speak a lot more about the details and the materials and all that, but uh, there's never enough money. The question is, is now the right time? Can people afford it, uh, or can we make it, can we get by without it? Um, I think we can find the money. As I said, I'm going to scour every inch of the budget. Uh, I'm going to go to the administration a and ask them to forgive us our amount, given the dire straits that Michigan is in. I'm hoping that we can uh, not have to pay our 
our $80 million match and still get our federal dollars that come in. Uh, and we need to look at, the, in the long run, how we fund roads as well, not just from the gas tax. We need to look at something a little more equitable, especially as we make the move toward uh, more fuel-efficient vehicles. As people are losing, using less vehicles, it could be the case that we increase the gas tax and still don't generate any more money. So we have to look at a comprehensive approach to roads and the other important priorities in our budget. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We have to move very quickly to our closing statements. Mr. Snyder, you have two minutes. Sure. Well, again, I want to thank the partners for doing this tonight. You've been presented two options tonight. Um, the mayor has presented a model that goes back to the traditional political world. I admire the mayor for his public service, but that model doesn't work anymore as a model of the last century. It is time to reinvent Michigan. We have people crying out for the need for more and better jobs and keeping our young people here. The way we're going to do that is with having a clear, positive vision, the year of innovation, by having a 10-point plan about creating jobs and an attitude of action where I'm a catalyst representing all of us in Lansing to say it's time for common sense, real world solutions. And that cultural issue, it is time to change our culture. We need to move from being negative to being positive. We need to move from looking in the rear view mirror to looking out towards the future. We need to stop being so divisive with this win-lose attitude and negativity and be inclusive and create a winning environment where the only label that matters is Michigander. It's by bringing that attitude that we can work and win together. It's by bringing that focus, that fire. I am absolutely fired up to do this. I hope you'll join me. It's time. This is our one chance. Let's go out there as 10 million people and say, it's time for more and better jobs. It's time to keep our young people here. And it's time to be a great state again. Mr. Venero, two minutes. My dad left Italy in 1948 for a chance at the American dream. He left all that he knew and loved for the chance at success in Michigan, and he found it. Not in vast riches or an endless bank account, but in hard work, matched by fair pay, a decent home, and a family that loves him. The Michigan that I grew up in was a Michigan of opportunity. My parents and godparents said that I could do anything if I, if I worked hard, and they were right. America was that kind of place, led by Michigan. Michigan was at the, a state at the top. We were the arsenal of democracy. We made the things that made America great. And I believe we can again. I know we can because I'm doing it in my city. I know because I've seen and felt the spirit of ingenuity and entrepreneurship all around this great state. This state is poised for renewal with the right leadership and the right plan. I believe we can and will make Michigan work again. But it'll take more than happy talk and corporate buzzwords. Michigan's problems won't fix themselves. We need to stand together and fight. When the auto industry was under attack and our workers were being thrown under the bus, I organized mayors from around the country. I went to Washington. I took to the airwaves, and I fought for Michigan. And Michigan needs a fighter now. The, this election offers a clear choice between the values of Main Street and the values of Wall Street. Standing up for the hardworking men and women of, of our Main Streets and neighborhoods and communities all across this state, or the values of Wall Street, putting the interests of the big banks and the Wall Street fat cats first. It's a choice between standing up for Michigan's small businesses and domestic manufacturing, or being part of the Wall Street outsourcing and offshoring, the Wall Street greed that has all but destroyed Michigan's economy. This is the fight of our lives. Now is the time to take a stand. Won't you join Join me in standing and fighting for the Michigan that we love, for that Michigan of opportunity that brought my dad and so many others to Michigan from around the country and around the globe. I know we can do it. I know we can put Michigan back on top. I'm asking for your vote and for your support. Thank you. That ends our debate here at Detroit Public Television. Thank you, Mr. Snyder and Mr. Bonero, for joining us. If you missed part of this program or want to watch it again, it'll be made available at myvote.org and at thecenterformichigan.net. I'm Stephen Henderson. And I'm Nolan Fenley. For everyone at Detroit Public Television and the Great Debates Coalition, thank you for watching.